Okay. Hello everyone. Welcome to audit and assurance classes at Global Phoenix GFX in short. So before we move on to our discussion, you know, before we uh, start with our topics of audit and assurance, first we need to understand what do we mean by audit and assurance and then we need to understand what is our paper pattern so that we can schedule our classes we can run our classes in accordance to your paper pattern right so audit and assurance previously called as f8 now called as a that is in short audit and assurance now your question paper structure first we will start with a question paper structure so your other fundamental papers like you know your uh, fr f7 financial reporting fm financial management for these papers you have a pattern uh, you have a paper pattern of section a having 15 questions 15 mcqs into two marks each that is 30 marks then you have section b where you will be given three scenarios each scenario will have five questions each question will be for two marks 3 5s are 15, 15 2s are 30 marks again. Then in section B, uh, section C, you will have two constructive response questions that is essay questions. You will have each question for 20 marks, totaling 40 marks. So your entire paper will be for 100 marks. This is for your other fundamental papers that is your FR and FM. For most of the students, up till F6, you get exemptions. So I am ignoring that particular topics. Now coming to your audit and assurance. Audit and assurance question paper is a little bit different. Now you instead of three sections, you only have two sections. First one is section A that is obviously three scenario based questions into five questions in each scenario into two marks for each MCQ. So three five is 15, 15 twos are 30 marks. And then you have section B. Again, section B is classified into two parts. See, total section B is again your constructive response questions which are again theoretical questions or essay questions as you know. You, here, you will have two questions into 20 marks each which will give you 40 marks and one question into 30 marks which will be for 30 marks. So, here 30 marks plus 40, 70, 70 plus 30, 100 marks. So, your total question paper will be having three scenarios two essay questions for 20 marks each and one question for 30 marks so 3 plus 2 plus 1 that is total six questions will be there in your uh, six questions will be there in your examination and in three questions three three of so those questions you will have five mcqs based on the scenario given now coming to the concept of audit and assurance first let's understand a concept called as agency theory then we can switch forward and we can understand what is audit and why it is required and what are the various contents that are expected out of an auditor and all other stuff who can be an auditor etc etc all that we uh, learn as we move forward so now first what do we mean by an agency theory to understand this we need to know that any corporate any company is a separate legal entity separate legal identity or entity now what do we mean by separate legal identity it means that a company is different from its founders a company is different from the people who control it a company is different from the people who manage it so basically company is a separate identifiable person a company can be sued in the court of law a company can sue on another person on the court of in the court of law so that means that it is having a separate entity for example if tomorrow a case is filed against reliance geo it doesn't mean that the case is filed against the Ambani's. There is a difference between the company and the owners of the company and the managers of the company. So we'll understand that in detail now. So for example, let's take, uh, let's say that, you know, some 20 members, these people, what they did is they formed a company, they established a company so that, you know, they can run their business. So let's say they created a company called as ABC company. Now this company did business like they you know they purchased raw material from various suppliers. Then they made the production. Then they sold that uh, production to an outside uh, customers. Then there is receivables, payables, etc, etc. So basically they started doing the business and they did their business activity. Now if you see carefully, if suppose ABC company, if suppose ABC company was unable to pay the debts if abc company is unable to pay the debts 
it doesn't mean that this 20 members who establish the company these people are not personally liable it means that they don't need to sell off their personal assets or they didn't, don't need to invest their personal money into the business. Whatever has been already invested in the business, that will become the capital of that business. And only from that only the payments will be made. The persons who are behind the establishment of the company, behind the formation of the company, they are not personally liable for the debts of the company unless they do have some unpaid capitals, etc, etc, which we'll learn in detail as we go forward. So now I hope you guys understood what is the concept of separate legal entity that means if the company is having debts they are not the debts of the owners of the company or managers of the company now again why am i using the word owners and managers multiple times so to understand that let's say you know in the previous example we took 20 people who started the company now imagine there are 2 lakh people like everybody invested like you know 10 bucks or 20 bucks or 30 bucks or whatever it is and like this there are millions of people who came together and they started a company they formed a company now it would be practically impossible for that million people to come and sit in a place and take a decision for example tomorrow if i say that you know there are uh, 50000 people who started the company and obviously you know that you know these people will become the shareholders of the company Okay, we also know that shareholders are the real owners of the company. That means because they are investing their hard earned money for the capital of the company. They are the people who are the real owners of the company. So this 50,000 shareholders will become the real owners. Okay. Now imagine if a company needs to take a decision whether a contract has to be given to Mr. X or Mr. Y or shall we give credit policy of 30 days or 40 days now a decision has to be taken in the company now to take this decision if we expect this 50,000 shareholders to come and sit in a meeting and majority voting need to be required that is 50% or more is required more than 50% is required so 25,000 people has to say yes or no assuming that all these people are attending the meeting again you know this 50,000 people may be uh, shareholders may be living in various parts of the country various parts of different different states and other stuff so it would be practically very difficult to bring all the people under one roof and then take a decision unanimously or even if not unanimously majority also it would be very difficult so now what the companies actually do is this 50,000 shareholders will appoint some representatives on their behalf appoint on their behalf some people called as the directors of the company now who are these directors these directors can be the shareholders of the company that means out of this 50,000 they can choose some people or else these people can be not, not the shareholders of the company they can be even outsiders as well so this 50,000 shareholders first what they do is they conduct a meeting they'll appoint the directors of the company that they'll state that okay this 10 people or this 15 people will be acting as the directors of the company now what will they do these directors they will take day-to-day -day decisions of the company day-to-day -day decisions of the company now please understand they are only given the power to take the day-to-day -day decisions of the company not the major decisions of the company like for example tomorrow if the directors want to merge this company with another company it's not that easy because the company is not the directors to just go and merge it wherever they want or whenever they want the company belongs to the shareholders shareholders are the real owners of the company directors are only given the power to take the day-to-day -day decisions relating to the business activities like how much credit policy should be given what is the discount policy of our company whether uh, we should uh, what do you call it uh, go with uh, excessive marketing or should we switch to the previous methods of marketing or is there a change required in the strategy of the company should we implement just in time or not so such kind of day-to-day -day decisions will be taken by the directors but the majority of the decisions like you know the major decisions the big decisions mergers amalgamations acquisitions the spin-off split off or else uh, demergers or else uh, taking huge loans over and above the share capital of the company appointment of auditors all these kind of major decisions will be still taken by the shareholders these people will take special decisions let's call them as special decisions no such word is used in the standards or in the act as such but let's use the word special decisions which are the major decisions like example amalgamations etc etc okay 
and these people will be taking day to day decisions like you know credit policy etc now let's move a little bit closer towards introducing the concept of audit and assurance to you now we came uh, we came to a conclusion that you know 50000 shareholders are there example example it's not a fixed number as such it can be 1 million it can be 10 million it can be 10000 it can be 2 it can be 10 whatever it is so <coughs> the shareholders are the real owners of the company they provide the life blood of business that is capital for the business then these people will appoint some representatives on their behalf called as the directors of the company these directors are appointed to take the day to day decisions related to the company but the major key decisions are still taken by the shareholders but now comes the problem the problem is that when you are appointing certain people as the directors of your entity and you are telling them that you know you take care of all the decisions relating to the operations you take care of all the decisions relating to the business activities day to day trade activities now they can you know uh, do all kinds of nonsense with your money like you are the real owners you gave your money to directors but they are not having any personal interest in the entity that means might be they they are not the shareholders of the company they may be an outsider so they are not really interested whether the company actually performs or not because they'll be appointed for a fixed salary or a fixed directors remuneration as such now when they have their remuneration fixed then they are no more interested in uh, you know creating wealth for the company or maximizing the wealth of the shareholders now they may take reckless decisions or they may take decisions which are not in the best interest of the shareholders now what can be done in this particular aspect to make sure that directors are acting on the best interest of the shareholders now the answer is very simple directors shall be held responsible they shall be held accountable accountable for what you cannot say that if the company runs into losses directors have to take the blame no that's not possible because you know directors are also individuals if that is the case no business will run in losses right so every business has the risks of profits and losses you cannot say that if risk if the profits are there then we will enjoy the dividend if losses are there directors you take the blame not possible ma so now coming back to the point of discussion here director shall be held responsible or accountable for what for providing information to the shareholders directors are expected to provide information to the shareholders okay let's just uh, you know make the points here information okay directors need to provide information to whom to shareholders okay now comes the question what information shall i produced to the shareholders the information that is required to be produced to the shareholders is nothing but financial information what actually happened in the organization what did you do with the money in that particular period now that is called as your financial statements financial statements now what are these five financial there are total five financial statements as per your ias 1 International Accounting Standard One Presentation of Financial Statements says that there are five financial statements. If you remember, first one is your statement of financial position, which is also called as balance sheet. Then you have statement of profit and loss, which you guys call it as P and L account, including other comprehensive income. To be very clear, then you have statement of changes in equity. Then you have cash flow statement. Then your account significant policies disclosures and notes to accounts in short notes right so we have these five financial statements statement of financial position statement of p&l statement of changes in equity statement of cash flows under ias 7 and then you have notes to accounts or accounting policies disclosures and notes to accounts now this information shall be provided to the shareholders now how will the shareholders believe whether this financial information financial statements provided by the directors whether it is actually true or not next question how shall these five financial statements be prepared like can they prepare in their own manner can they prepare in whatever manner they like it or however they like it can they prepare in whatever format they wish that's not allowed <coughs> these five financial statements shall be prepared as per the applicable financial reporting framework which in short we call it as afrf applicable financial reporting framework now what do we mean by applicable financial reporting framework there are certain frameworks which are prepared now 
which again you learn in your strategic business reporting paper conceptual framework 2018 which is recently issued now what are this for your basic understanding just at a basic level the framework includes your standards your company laws or companies acts whatever it is etc now this particular uh, framework that is basically standards or companies and they tell you how to prepare your financial statements they tell you how what are the elements that are required in the financial statements they tell you what are the concepts what are the disclosures what are the measurements what are the valuation basis what are the model of accounting so everything is given as a guidance note as a uh, suggestion or as a rule for you again principle based approach versus rule based approach which you might have learned in your financial reporting already now again for us in uh, your uh, ACCS syllabus you have two different types of standards for financial reporting one is your IAS other one is your IFRS IAS stands for international accounting standards and IFRS stands for international financial reporting standards now which standards shall be followed is again a choice of the company again they can either follow international financial reporting standards that is IFRS or IAS or they can also follow their national standards like for India we have INDAS right we have IND AS for India. Similarly, previously we used to have accounting standards AS1, AS2, AS3, AS4 like that. And uh, for example, if you go to UK, they have FRS, financial reporting standards. If you go to US, there is US gap for them. There are statements of US gap again. Like whatever may be the framework that you are choosing, whether it is international or whether it is national, the framework will tell you what are the financial statements that are required, what are the elements that are there, measurement basis, disclosures and other stuff relating to the elements. Now, the directors have a responsibility to prepare the financial statements in accordance with that particular applicable financial reporting framework now what is the conclusion so uh, first shareholders will be there they appoint the directors now directors will take business decisions right they take the business decisions and they prepare financial statements again these financial statements will be issued to the shareholders now can we expect that the shareholders will be having an idea about the applicable financial reporting framework like suppose you know a, a shareholder one of the shareholders he doesn't have any knowledge about the financial statements he doesn't have any knowledge about accounting he doesn't have any knowledge about any uh, topics related to the finance now can we expect him to look at the financial statements like P&L, revenue, cost of goods sold, administration expenses, general and administration, selling and distribution. He will not be able to identify or understand that growth rates, dividend per share, equity, uh, shareholders, earnings, equity, uh, earnings per share. So all these concepts he might not be able to understand. He, we can't expect that every shareholder will have the knowledge of EPS under IAS 33. That's not possible. So now we need a layer between shareholders and the directors we need somebody who is a knowledgeable independent third party who is looking into the financial statements and expressing an opinion on those financial statements seeing whether they are actually prepared as per the frf or not as per the financial reporting framework that is applicable or not now that person is nothing but your auditor that person is the auditor now what did we just discuss auditors responsibility the primary responsibility of the auditor is to a express an opinion on the financial statements express an opinion on financial statements what opinion whether they are in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework AFRF what he needs to do is take the financial statements prepared and presented by the directors that is the management compare them with the applicable financial reporting framework standards accounting standards that is FRS IFRS or else IIS or national standards or whatever it is so look compare these two framework versus the financial statements are they matching with each other or not are they are the financial statements prepared in accordance with the framework or not see 
auditor is not there to evaluate the performance of the company ma auditor is not there to say that directors have misused the money or else directors did not take careful decisions directors took rapid decisions or else they took aggressive decisions no auditor's responsibility is not to comment upon the decisions taken by the directors auditor's responsibility is to check whether the financial statements whatever information is presented in the financial statements that is as per the applicable financial reporting framework or not and whether it is in complying with the accounting standards and other stuff that is applicable for that particular entity or not so express an opinion on the financial statements whether they are prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework and whether they are presented and expressing a true and fair view true and fair view whether they are correct or not see previously uh, it was true and correct but then it is not possible for an auditor to express an opinion saying that the financial statements are true and correct why can't we express a correct opinion because you know auditors there are so many limitations inter, uh, inherent limitations to audit which we will discuss later since this is an introduction session i don't want to go into the complexity of the standards and complexity of the audit procedures as such so you need to understand that auditor cannot give a 100% assurance saying that financial statements are absolutely correct that's not possible now assurance now what do we mean by assurance assurance means like a guarantee it's like a uh, confidentiality increasing factor like suppose if i'm telling you that you know one of your classmates told that uh, this particular chapter is very easy you may believe in that you might not believe in that but if i am telling you that this particular chapter is easy you might believe it because you know a person with experience a person with knowledge a person with detailed analysis of that particular element when they are telling you something you rather believe them rather than not believing them that is called as assurance the confidentiality increasing factor is called as assurance now auditor what he is doing is by expressing an opinion on the financial statements he is telling that yes i am an independent person i am a knowledgeable person i have knowledge about the applicable financial reporting framework and i have expressed an opinion based upon professional skepticism i conducted an audit i did a review of your financial statement now when he is expressing an opinion shareholders will have a belief they can assure on that particular financial statements now there are different different types of assurance that you need to understand before we start with audit and assurance topic now assurance may there is something called as absolute assurance then there is reasonable assurance and limited assurance absolute assurance reasonable assurance and limited assurance now what do we mean by absolute assurance absolute assurance means a 100% guarantee like you know uh, the auditor is telling that i have literally looked into every single aspect of the business every single element of the financial statements i vouched each and every transaction i made sure that whatever is presented on the financial statements it is absolutely correct beyond a point of doubt which is not practically possible con uh, considering the inherent limitations of the audit as such now that is called as absolute assurance which is not practically possible then comes reasonable assurance reasonable assurance means that you know 90% of the guarantee can be given by the auditor saying that the financial statements are presented in overall they are presented in, presenting a true and fair view financial stat statements as a whole are presenting uh, true and fair uh, true and fair view or as the auditor is telling you that you know the financial statements as a whole are free from material misstatements the auditor is not telling that they are absolutely correct that they are telling you that as a whole they are free from material misstatements whether they are whether caused due to fraud or error that's a different aspect now reasonable assurance means 90 to 95% assurance is being given by the auditor saying that the financial statements are kind of true and fair now this is true and correct this is true and fair now comes limited assurance limited assurance is basically like you know the audit we will not call him as an auditor as such but let's let's for an example ma just for introductory session understand that you appointed a third party you appointed a person and told him that we are doubtful that in this particular aspect of our business like the sales manager he is committing a fraud so we request you to investigate the actions of this particular person and tell us whether these are uh, there are any fraud or error or not so basically what you are trying to do is that you are telling the person the independent person 
to look into selected areas of your business and give a report on that particular stuff like an investigation report there what that person will do is he'll be framing a negative worded report negative worded report in the sense he'll say that given my uh what do you call it uh, responsibility given my work duty based upon what is the agreement between us there are no misstatements there are no mistakes that i have found he is not telling that everything is fine or he is not telling that something is good he is telling that nothing is bad there is a difference between being good versus not being bad right so in a limited assurance the person will be saying that based upon my work based upon the limited area that i am restricted to i did not find any mistakes in this particular area he is not telling that this is fair or this is true or this is correct he is telling that i did not find any mistakes in this particular selected area that is called as limited assurance you cannot keep your belief in that particular stuff suppose for example you went to a doctor for your health checkup if the doctor is telling that you know after the after the checkup is done if the doctor is telling you that you know your uh, reports are amazing there are no issues with your report there is literally no problem that is absolute assurance you'll be very happy with that or if the uh, if the doctor is saying that best to the best of my knowledge based upon the reports that i am uh, having in my hand i do think that you are you are not having any issues i do think that you know you are uh, okay there are no problems with you that is reasonable assurance limited assurance is like you know i did only this reports and in this reports i did not find any mistakes he is not telling that your health is good or bad he is just telling that from this particular reports which i did or which i uh, verified there are no problems that i could identify so that is limited assurance you cannot keep your confidence in a limited assurance so it depends upon how much confidence is the auditor giving to the users of the financial statements that is called as the assurance level whether it is an absolute assurance whether it is a reasonable assurance or whether it is a limited assurance so now i gave you an overall picture about the audit and assurance topic audit talks about the procedure that is required to be conducted Uh, what are the verification responsibilities what are the standards that need to be followed the uh, comparison between the financial statements and the applicable financial reporting framework so everything is covered under the audit assurance is nothing but the confidence level that the auditor is giving to the shareholders he is assuring the shareholders that yes you can be, uh, believe this financial statements yes you can rely upon this financial statements to take economic decisions that is the overall concept of audit and assurance i did not touch even a single chapter in this introductory session i just gave you a broad overview about the entire subject so your paper structure then we switch to the agency theory which uh, states that the company is different from the shareholders and the directors shareholders are the real owners of the company directors are the people who take the decisions related to the day to day activities of the business so the shareholders need to believe that the directors are taking best decisions based upon the best interest of the shareholders to make sure that that, that is happening we appoint the auditor in uh, business the auditor will not verify the uh activities of the directors as such he will only look into the financial statements and confirm whether they are prepared as per the applicable financial reporting framework or not and then the three different levels of assurance absolute assurance reasonable assurance and limited assurance whether 100% true and correct information is presented or not whether a true and fair information is presented or not or whether according to our uh, according to our <coughs> work that is done based upon the restricted activity level that we have performed whether there are any misstatements that we identified or whether we did not identify any issues whether it is absolute reasonable or limited assurance so that brings us to the end of this introductory session i hope you understood the overall objective of the auditor that is to express an opinion on the financial statements whether they are prepared in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework and whether they are presenting a true and fair view or not so i hope you got the complete uh, basic picture about audit and assurance subject so i really wish that you know you will enjoy the uh, subject and the ongoing classes uh, wish you good luck thank you